This is Movers and Shakers, where we interview the upcoming generation of make it happen multifamily investors to share their story. Welcome to the Movers and Shakers podcast. My name is Gino Barbaro, co founder of Jake and Gino, multifamily investor, educator, father, mentor. And I am joined by my co-host, my brosif, Josh Rusin, the community director of Jake and Gino. And Josh, how are you today, Josh? Gino, doing well, making it happen. Very excited after this, hopping on a plane, coming to visit you and the family in St. Augustine. Then we got some time in Disney. And then we have Multifamily Mastery Live. What's going on in your world over there? Just want to make a little quick joke. Everyone, Josh is trying to get an Uber to the airport and he can't figure that out. So that makes an older person like me feel great because the technology, I'm not the only technology moron out there. So it's, it's a good feeling, good way to start the podcast. I'm doing good. We're getting ready for our, our event this weekend. So picture and imagine 500 people speaking in front of them, having our student community there. It's going to be, it's, it's a lot of work, like we said, but it's just so rewarding to have the whole community out there. And it's putting people in an environment where they can succeed, right? Having like-minded people in an environment, being able to learn from a lot of great speakers that we have. And it's just going to be a lot of fun. So Looking forward to it. Super excited about that. Speaking of exciting things, I'm excited about today's guest. Today we have mm. Mark Henteman. So Mark is an Emmy nominated writer and producer who has written for David Letterman, Family Guy, and created shows for Fox and MTV. He's also maintained an avid multifamily investing side hustle for nearly 20 years, having bought a duplex with his first script payment. He since built a $70 million portfolio and founded the company Quantum Capital, which manages and syndicates multifamily investments in core areas of major cities. His mission is to help others achieve financial stability and freedom through real estate investing so they don't have to become television writers. Welcome to the show, Mark. Thanks. Thanks for having me. You know, I, one thing going through the bio that really stands out to me. So when you have a $70 million portfolio and it's a, a side hustle, you're definitely doing something right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's the power of real estate. It's uh, who who knew? So yeah, so let's talk about that. How you got into real estate? So you get that first check from the script, and then you decide you want to buy a duplex. Where did that come from? Why? And then where did we go from there? Yeah, I think that came from insecurity. I, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. Didn't know anyone who had ever uh, been even managed a career in the entertainment industry. I thought it was probably a very, very long shot. Uh, I moved up to New York. I was the proverbial starving artist and I was getting some, some work here and there, but also waking up in the middle of the night, a little bit panicked about how I was gonna pay my rent, how I was gonna sustain this for the long term and would I ever have any kind of economic stability and you know, I love writing. I loved pursuing a dream of mine, and I had a lot of passion for that. But I didn't really like the anxiety, the economic financial anxiety. And so when I when I uh, moved to LA, got a couple, uh, uh, stumbled onto this new show called Family Guy, and and started writing scripts for them, and got some script payments. I was looking to invest that money and somehow build an economic future. And I didn't know what I was going to invest in, but I was in an apartment and I had wandered into an open house with my wife and uh, the broker at the open house was like, you should, uh, you know, you've got a little bit of money saved. You should put it toward a mortgage and buy a house. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like I am convinced that uh, I could be unemployed in the next six months. And I'm in this very insecure business and volatile business and I don't want the responsibility of a mortgage. And we talked a little bit and I said, you know what, I would consider it, but it would have to be the best investment I've ever made and don't show me anything else. And so uh, instead of a house, she called me a couple weeks later uh, to her credit. I thought I'd never hear from her again. And she said, I found the property you need to buy, but there's a catch. You need to become a landlord. And I was like a landlord. I don't, I don't, that doesn't sound very fun. Uh, but I went to it. It was this uh, 1920s building in a, a, a up and coming area in LA and it needed a lot of work, but it had great character. It had great architecture to it. And I said, okay, let's try it. I, I trusted her and got into a bidding war. 
Uh, it was LA, of course. So there were, I think there was 15 other bidders on this property and went up, you know, went up from, it was listed at 379,000. And after two weeks of this wild roller coaster ride I was on, where I had no idea what I was doing, I won the bid at $435,000 and, and got the property. And I thought that was probably the biggest mistake I had ever made and that I would be bankrupt or maybe even go to jail due to this thing. <laughs> but I decided to try and embrace it. And I became a landlord. I uh, rented out to my friend, uh, Mike Henry, who does voices on uh, Family Guy and, uh, and renovated the, the property. Year one, I was convinced I had made the worst decision I had ever made. Year two, I uh, refinanced and, and lowered my rate and pulled out some money. And I thought, well, maybe this is going to be okay. And then year three, I think the tenant moved out and uh, we raised the rents by a significant amount. And I was like, this is the greatest thing I've ever done. And um, it was paying a lot of my, I think my, the next door unit was paying all of my mortgage. And I had found that thing that would bring me financial stability and still do a, a writing career. Mark, this sounds like Josh's journey with me. The first year he comes with me, he thinks it's the biggest mistake of his entire life. <laughs> what am I doing in St. Augustine with Gino? The second year, he's like, this, this is pretty good. I like this. I've got people to cook for me. I can hang out with Gino's family. In the third year, he's like, wow, I just refied out. I'm having fun. The biggest thing in the world. So it's amazing how the journey is from a problem that you're looking at, it becomes an amazing opportunity. And it's all about the long game. If you can stick in there in the long game and you need to get, catch some breaks along the way, but if you can stick there for the long game and, and do it, it, it's that's an awesome story. I love it. What I want to ask you really is, there are not very many artists out there who are investors. What makes you unique to be able to look at an investment and say, this is great, I want to tackle this, especially real estate. What, what qualities do you think you have that make you a, a good investor? I don't know. I think there's a lot of writers that are also very analytical and very good at math. Mm -hmm. So it's a surprising trait that a lot of good writers are also math, a bit of math whizzes. I don't know that I'm any kind of math whiz. I think I just have drive and discipline and, you know, I'm patient. I think that's what got me into the entertainment business. And uh, when everybody else had given up, I think I could be persistent almost to a fault. And uh, I think I did that with, with writing and, I, and I've done that with real estate. I just kind of maybe don't know what else to do. So I just keep doing the same thing and, uh, and just persist. Wow. So everyone out there, uh, pen and paper, I want everyone to write this down. The four things, I was going to give you three, but the four things, Mark says he has patience, he has drive, he has discipline, and he has persistence. So that patience, drive, discipline, and persistence is what makes up, from what I hear, his ability to take these deals down. But that's awesome. I mean, what do you look for in investment? When you look, because California is definitely different than other parts of the country, and everyone says you can't invest in your backyard in California. What makes you look at a deal and say, I like this deal in California? Yeah, and, and ironically, I didn't know anything else like California, LA was the pool I learned to swim in. Mm -hmm. And I just described how I stumbled into my first investment. And that was in the heart of Hollywood in LA. And I just started, I wasn't looking anywhere else because this was where I was living and, and this opportunity has had presented itself to me there. And then as soon as that one did well, I started, I, I knew I have to do this all the time and I'm going to do this for the rest of my life because this is the best compliment to my entertainment career. And, uh, and it, it has, I've never wavered on that opinion. And that was back in 2000. So it's been 20 years and like going back a little bit to, you know, uh, your experience with, with, uh, Jake and how, or, or, and how he thought it was a mistake at the beginning. I was telling, so do you know Nick Amaluxen, who is in, uh, yes. is in the program with you guys? And we bought, we bought three properties in Austin, Texas in the last couple months. And we bought 200 units. And, uh, and I was telling him recently that, uh, yeah, every property I own, 
I basically think it's a mistake the entire time I own it until I sell. And then I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> this was the best thing. Um, and I did that recently. I, I bought a, I bought a, I bought a 20 unit building in LA in 2013. And I think I paid 2.9 million for it. And I put down 900,000. The entire time I owned it, there were problems, there were leaks, there were tenant issues. And I use third party property management, but it was just, it was, it was drawing me in on, on more than I wanted to. And I thought this building's a problem. Uh, and then I sold it this summer and uh, sold it for seven and a half million. And, and uh, I think my 900,000 turned into 5.4 million and six X the, the investment. I'm like, Oh yeah, this, th that's always what happens. It's like, I always, think that I made a mistake because real estate has headaches, <laughs> has headaches ongoing. And mm -hmm. you know, if you have expectations that it's going to be to entirely passive, it's not going to be the case. I love that though. But think about that, Josh, you're putting all that work in. So picture when you first bought the property, I can picture those leaks coming through the walls. So I've had them, right? But if you're out there, is it worth dealing with some tenants yelling at you and some leaks in a wall for a $5 million return on your money? Most people will never make that in their entire lives. Mark made that on one deal and it is work. You're not going to take care of a building and it's going to be completely passive, even with third party property management, but you have to look at the, the risk reward. I mean, I would love to do that kind of job. And, and I'm on that kind of deal. It's not a 40 hour work week. Mark is doing it part time. That's the other thing that he's doing. He's creating his wealth for part time and he's just flipping it. How did you get into that Austin or Houston market with Nick? What, what made you go out of California and go into a different market? So it was probably back in 2014, uh, 14 or 15, when I had had a portfolio in LA of about 20 properties. And I was thinking like, I should really pick a second market, hedge against LA, you know, LA has earthquakes, um, you know, and just, it's just good to diversify. And I set out to find what's my, what's my second market? What's the best place that I can find? And I looked at metrics. I analyzed every city, every uh, market and, you know, just had a hard, I, I zeroed in on Austin pretty, pretty early on. I was looking at Austin, Salt Lake city and a couple other places, but I liked all of the trends happening in Austin. I think it was the fast, it's been the fastest growing city uh, for almost 10 years. And it also in Texas, which is such a, a business friendly state, it has the most restrictive building codes and regulations. So there's a, it doesn't overbuild. There's mm -hmm. a, there's a lack of supply there. And I like that. I like it as a big tech city, but I kind of sat on the fence you know, kind of second guessing myself, like, ah, it's, it's, I want to, Austin's the place for me. And, uh, I, I want to, but I don't know how to manage properties long distance. And then Nick contacted me after, I think it was possibly your, or possibly when I did your podcast, or I think I was on a podcast and he, he reached out and he was like, Hey, I, I, uh, at first, it was an email that just said, hey, I, I enjoyed your podcast. If you ever have uh, time, to, uh, I'd love to pick your brain. And I emailed him back and I said, sure. And uh, when I was talking to him on the phone, you know, I could tell he was very determined to, to get in and very driven. And uh, he happened to be in Austin. And I didn't really think about it at the time. But I think right before we hung up, I'm like, hey, uh, you, know, you live in Austin. Austin's a market that I, I like and have wanted to get into if you would want to, uh, you know, if you, if you would want to look together and you could be the legs on the ground, boots on the ground, uh, that's something that could be an interesting scenario. And he's, and we just kind of hung up and, uh, then he contacted me a couple of weeks later, he was motivated to do that. And we talked, we were talking all the time and looking at a lot of properties. That's and awesome. Now we're off and running. What would you tell investors out there who are trying to get into multifamily? Like what tips would you give them to get into it? Because that, that is a great tip right there. If your boots on the ground and you're starting to get out there and you don't have the capital, maybe you reach out to somebody who does have the capital or who has more experience and you're willing to do all the legwork, you're willing to property manage. Um, what other tips would you give investors out there? 
Yeah, I think that's a great one. I think partnering, I think uh, educating yourself. And I think uh, one, one other one is, is be careful now. Uh, it, it, it's, it's been, what, 10 years of a, of a boom cycle. And uh, I think, uh, you know, be disciplined, know your criteria, know what you're willing to pay and try to stick to it. Mm -hmm. So how are you being disciplined right now in the, in the market? I, you know, I think I've evolved my criteria pretty narrowing it down to a very specific set of criteria and I don't waver. I, I see tons of, of properties every day. I get barraged with uh, property listings and I say no to, you know, 99.9% .9 of them. I probably look at a thousand buildings thousand properties before I will jump at one of them. And I think, uh, yeah, I think that's my criteria is, is value add. It's gotta be value add. It's gotta, it's gotta be in a, a rapidly transitioning neighborhood because I think, you know, on the broader picture, we're going to see some slowing mm -hmm. or, or it, we're, we'll potentially see some slowing. So I want to find a pocket that's, accelerating mm -hmm. uh in, in, in i i know those pockets in la and and we've started to zero in on those in austin uh yeah i think it, i think my criteria is yeah value add b and c class uh workforce housing and i it's got to be a five cap or above and these, these are sort of la criteria but five cap and above which are hard to find which eliminates 85 percent of the properties Mm -hmm. And then I have to be able to get 75% LTV. And that that's because over the, in retrospect, all my best deals had decent leverage. Leverage, you know, it's dangerous and risky, but it's also powerful. It's the fuel. Yep. And it can work both ways. Like you said, if, if you're leveraging an asset and you have a downward spiral, your, your leverage is just going to make it that much more painful. But on the flip side, if you have leverage and you know the asset goes up and like you did, you had nine hundred thousand dollars of of, uh, of down payment, and all of a sudden that turns into five million dollars. Leverage works both ways. Yeah, yeah. I guess I haven't thought of this, but if I didn't use leverage, that would be two point nine million would have turned into five point four. It would have been less than a two two x. Mm -hmm. And but with leverage, it became a six x. Yep, so I love that. And, and that, lever that leverage also allows you to diversify your assets. So you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket so you can still leverage up and get those benefits. And by owning two buildings that are appreciating, it's going to make your returns that much more. I love that. One thing I did want to touch on, Mark, is I know you've done a great job with your inter internal teams with third-party property management with hiring. How have you scaled up from when you first started all by yourself to, you know, to the team that you have today now? Yes. How did I scale up? I think I was very lucky for example, that first broker, that fr first broker who brought me that duplex back in 2000 was so crucial to my investment career mm -hmm. in hindsight. If they were greedy or just looking to slam me into a building and get their commission and it didn't work out, I probably never would have done a second deal. But when at that time in my life when I knew nothing, I had the guidance of someone that was trustworthy and that became a great investment for me. Mm -hmm. And so I've had some luck over my career in finding partners and team members that are, are really assets to me that are, that I can depend on and are extremely help, helpful. My team, you know, I have a, a, a number of brokers that I work with. I have a, on the loan side, I have a, a loan broker, who I've done 45 loans with, and he's great. He navigates the system. You know, he navigates the process mm -hmm. very well. He takes everything off my plate, gets things done. Uh, I have a property management company that, you know, is like a third generation family of real estate investors. And they were, they were managing properties when they were 12 years old and they just know everything their, their experience is really deep. I have, uh, yeah. And then I have just advisors and team members, lawyers, insurance agent. My insurance agent has 900 units in LA. 
which is, you know, more than way more than I have. He started after the earthquake in 95 or something. And that mm -hmm. was a good time to build a fortune yeah. in Los Angeles. I like that. So what I hear is the harder you work, the luckier you get. And Jake and I have a very similar story to yours. When we bought our first deal, our the broker we bought it from really, I don't want to say he took us under his wing, but he really showed us value and he had a, he had some kind of you know trust in us because then three months later, we got our second deal with him. And then six months later, we got our third deal with him. So if you show people that you're willing to work and you do as you say and you say as you do, I think they'll reciprocate and they will take you under your wings. But to your point, you worked really hard to get those deals and we did the same thing. So I think that's really important also. Yeah. And you know, one thing that I was just thinking about recently is, uh, is, you know, not when I, when I started investing was never exciting for me, like a 401k, the idea of putting 10% of your money into a 401k and then getting 4% returns from you know handing it to uh, an investment advisor was never very exciting to me, and so I wasn't really motivated to do that. But in in real estate, I get so excited by properties, I get so excited by the investment prospects of it that I don't like. I put off home my own home renovations. I put off buying new cars because all I want to do is put everything I have into smart investments because, and I also trust myself. I know how to navigate multifamily real estate and I know where the opportunities are and it's, it's exciting and exhilarating to me. So I never want to do anything else. I love that. Uh, let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. Hello everybody, Jake and Gino here. And it's that time of year again, Rand cares is looking to feed 20,000 hungry children this fall and we can do it with your help. Our mission is to improve the lives of others by creating communities that allow people to become the best versions of themselves. Brand Cares was created to help further this mission. Please visit our Jake and Gino Facebook page and click the Rand Cares link pinned to the top of the page to donate and help fulfill our mission by feeding 20,000 hungry kids this fall. Thank you for partnering with our family of companies to make a huge impact in our community. Okay, Mark, I got some short answer questions here for you. What is your favorite book you've ever read and why? <laughs> okay. Uh, what's my favorite book I've ever read and why? Um, I don't know. I like to catch her in the rye. <laughs> <laughs> you got to take me back to 10th grade it. English there. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Okay, what about best habit for success? Best habit for success. I think uh I think uh mindset. Mindset is that a habit? That's not really a habit. It, you know, discipline, doing things, doing the process, working the process day in and day out. And having Yeah, no, so I'm going to go back on that one. I like mindset and motivation and things like that because like showering, right? Motivation isn't something you have, it's something you do. A power plant doesn't have energy, it produces it, right? So you like you shower daily. So in, currently you're continually ingraining those type of things in my mind is what allows me to, you know, kind of create the lens that I see the world through. And it has, like you said, that optimism, that drive, that discipline, that dedication and persistence to make things happen. So I, I think that definitely would count as a habit, right? Josh, yeah. And Oh, no, let me go back to those four again, um, real quick. The four, the patience, the persistence, the drive, and the discipline. They sound like key words, but if you're really patient in life, like Mark, and you look at hundreds and hundreds of deals, you have the motivation and the drive. Mark was a, is a starving artist when he first starts out. He has the drive to actually not wake up in the middle of the night. We all know how that feels, right? And, and not know if you're going to pay for your bills, right? Especially having six kids where you're going to eat all the food, you know, money for that food, right? the discipline to actually get up and analyze those deals and walk those properties and, and get up and do your full-time job at the same time and having that persistence just to keep on persisting. You know, you're, you're going to get knocked down. You're going to have leaky pipes. You're going to have tenants that are going to give you problems, all that, but you have a long game and you have put all four of those together and that's rocket fuel. Forget about leverage. That is rocket fuel. So, you know, hats off. 
Love it. All right, Gino, there were definitely some golden nuggets on this one. And I feel like you just summed some of them up, but what else can you add to some of the takeaways from the show? Dude, I didn't know you were going to hit me with that so quick. I was like, wow, I was just going to, um, I mean, there's a lot. I think Mark has got an amazing story because he doesn't hate his job. He, he loves his job and, and he's doing real estate on the side to complement it. And he's using real estate. To me, it seems like a real, uh, a vehicle to when he wants to retire, but Maybe he doesn't want to retire. Maybe he wants to, once he finishes his writing and he doesn't feel like writing anymore, he can continue on with his real estate portfolio. So that is great. Real estate can offer so many different paths to people, whether you want to do it full time, whether you want to do it part time. It's an amazing vehicle for, for tax shelter. It's an amazing vehicle for so many things for principal pay down, for cash flow, for building a business. Uh, I love his story on that. And he just, he just he became very proactive. And like I keep saying, those four things that he talks about really have propelled his growth. What have you seen, Josh, from, from Mark and his story that's unique? Yeah, I think what you summed up the recipe, those four traits that allowed Mark to be able to create a $70 million portfolio as a side hustle. I think that uh, that recipe produces the right results. And I, I think you can definitely apply that, right? And it's, you know, there's no magic wand or anything like that. It's just putting in the work and making it happen. Mark, where can people get a hold of you? You could reach out to me at uh, my company's called Quantum Capital, and it's quantumcapitalinc.com. Uh, you could email it, me at mark at quantumcapitalinc.com. You could also email me at markhenteman at me.com. Um, yeah. Any final words? You know, I was thinking uh, that. Uh, I, you know, the other, the other book that I was thinking about was, uh, was I think it's called Secrets of Power Negotiating. And I think it's Roger Dawson. And I read it back in probably the early 2000s. And I think now, final thoughts, my th final thought is now is a good time to have negotiating skills because mm -hmm. everything you look at, they're trying to achieve top dollar. And it's a seller, it's been a seller's market. And, you know, with most properties, they're going to be overpriced. And I'm just coming out of a couple tough deals where they were negotiating hard and I had to negotiate hard in response to, to keep the price within my criteria. And, mm -hmm. and it wasn't easy. And, it, and I was drawing back upon this book that, that some of the techniques I was using and it paid off and we just removed contingencies on a couple properties. And I'm very happy with the way they turned out. And a lot of it had to do with knowing how to negotiate. <clears throat> That's awesome. I, I like that. And Mark, you know, I want to thank you for being an amazing guest on the show and sharing your movers and shakers story. Now guys, if you want to be the next movers and shakers guest, email me, Josh at Jake and Now, if you like the show, please leave us a review. And until next time, let's make it a movers and shakers week. See you, everyone. Thanks, Thanks you guys. Thank you.